Please welcome Ms. Haley Hagelin. So, you know when you first meet someone and they look really nice and sort of boring, and then you find out that you know, they, they get in car crashes on purpose because it's the only thing that makes them feel sexually aroused. <laughs> I'm not like that, okay? I'm as nice and boring as I look. Um, I'm the good child in my family. And I didn't exactly choose it for it to be that way. I sort of inherited that title by default. See, I'm the youngest of three. My sister Jillian is eight years older and my brother Eric is five years older. And, you know, since I came last, they sort of got first dibs on all the cool shit. So I got the scary room in the attic, I always got the hump seat in the middle on car trips, and I was the good child. Um, my sister had actually claimed the title of bad kid long before my brother or I could ever give her a run for her money. Um, you know, and we tried. We really tried, but she did not fuck around. <laughs> so I remember when uh, <laughs> we got really into prank calling, my brother and I, and we figured out a way to call radio stations, and we had this trick where we could run down the seven second delay, and one time we actually got the phrase, and I quote, cocksucker, cocksucking dickweed, asshole, asshole, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, before they hung up on us. <laughs> And I was like, oh, we're so bad. We're going to get in so much trouble. And then my sister got sent to rehab. <laughs> and then one time, we were playing with smoke bombs in our neighborhood, and um, we accidentally lit the neighbor's tree on fire, uh, which lit the neighbor's roof on fire, which lit the neighbor's neighbor's roof on fire. And we were like, come on, arson. That's a fucking crime. We've got to get in trouble for this one. And then my sister tried to kill herself. So. And I actually remember that night, um, my mom was at the hospital with my sister and my dad was um, trying to explain to us what happened. And he, he had his briefcase open, I remember. And at one point he just sort of, he started crying right into his briefcase. And he, and he said to us, he said, I just don't know what to do. Can you tell me what to do? And I just looked at him and I, I thought, oh, dude, I'm eight. <laughs> um, you might want to ask someone with the wisdom of a fourth grade education. But I also sort of realized at that moment that it wasn't my responsibility to be worse than my sister. Um, I was supposed to actually be the good kid because Someone had to show my parents that they weren't total failures. Uh, they weren't. They were great parents. They still are, you know. They did all the things you're supposed to do. They took us to Dairy Queen and they let us have a dog. And, um, and I love my sister. I really love her. But, um, you know, I really believe that um, my mom just sort of shot a dud out of the womb. <laughs> And it happens, okay? Like even Bruce Springsteen wrote Tunnel of Love, okay? <laughs> so, fast forward to my junior year in college and everyone in my family is grasping for their fullest potential. Um, I am a student at Yale. My brother is a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa and my sister is homeless and addicted to crystal meth. <laughs> Uh, you like that? Uh, it was funny for us to, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but so all is right with the world. And um, I, I'm about to come home just for two weeks to Denver and then I have this fellowship that I've received to Brazil. Uh, so I have a very high achieving summer sprawled out in front of me. And I come home to Denver, and it's, it's the last night that, before I leave to Brazil, and my best friend and Abby and I decide, we got to celebrate. And instead of deciding to celebrate in Denver, we're like, no, we're going to drive to Boulder, this city that's 45 miles away, because we heard they had really strong margaritas at this restaurant. <laughs> 
Now you might think like the decision to drive 45 miles for a really strong drink seems retarded. <laughs> um, but honestly, it didn't occur to me that I would get in trouble because that's not what I did. So the whole night is sort of a sloppy slideshow now in my memory. I remember being at the restaurant and then I remember being at a bar and losing my credit card. And then I remember being at the gas station buying a six pack because Abby and I really needed some drinks for the ride home. <laughs> and then I remember being at Taco Bell because I was gonna totally puke if I didn't need some Taco Bell before we got on the road. <laughs> And then I remember um, seeing lights and hearing sirens and trying to remember how you pull over on the highway. And then Abby just squeezing my hand and saying, don't worry, our dads are both lawyers. <laughs> so, um, the officer asked me to step out of the car and walk 10 steps. And according to the police report, because I don't remember this, I walked 29 steps and then, quote, very politely asked if I could stop. So he put handcuffs on me and he told Abby that she couldn't come with us to the police station, so she should sort of walk in the direction of the lights of the city that maybe someone could help her there. Uh, <laughs> so it's crazy how fast you sober up in the back of a police car. And I thought to myself, shit, I wish I had asked him to do this before he gave me the roadside test, because I think I really would have nailed it now. <laughs> but I didn't say that, I just, I, I sat quietly, and it, it's so big in the back of those things, and you feel so small. And at one point, the officer sort of turned back and yelled, you know, I really appreciate your outstanding behavior. I'm definitely going to make a note of this in my police report. <laughs> and I was like, I can't believe this. Even as a criminal, I am getting gold stars for my good behavior. <laughs> and we get to the station. And a, a female police officer is there and she takes my mug shot, which I smiled for because I think it's rude to scowl when someone's taking your picture. And uh, you know, she checked out at work and she just sort of said, that's a lovely picture. <laughs> so when you get your one phone call, you don't, there, it's always collect. And so the first thing that whoever you're calling hears is um, you are receiving a collect call from the Boulder County Sheriff's Department. <laughs> Will you accept the charges? And so I hear my dad at the other end of the line and he says, yes, yes. And then he's there and he says, Jillian, what happened? And I just say, no, dad, it's Hallie. <laughs> and uh, he didn't really sound angry. He just sort of sounded sad and, and tired. Um, but don't worry, he got a full night of sleep because he didn't pick me up till the next morning. <laughs> so they don't put you uh, really in a, in a cell, they just put me in sort of like a holding area with this, um, this older guy and this African-American woman and I was really scared and at one point I started crying and the woman was trying to, to console me and she said, you're fine. Nice white looking girl like you, you're fine. <laughs> Have you ever been in trouble before? And I sort of shook my head and she said, you're fine. <laughs> and she was right. And the, and the next morning my dad came. <laughs> my dad came and picked me up. And we didn't really say much in the car. Uh, at one point he, uh, he turned to me and he actually said, aren't you gonna say anything? Don't you have anything to say? And I didn't, so I just stared out the window and he didn't ask again. And he dropped me off at home and went to work and I let myself in because my mom had also already gone to work and I went and I sat down in the kitchen just sort of numbly reading my police report and all of a sudden I heard a noise. 
And a couple months ago, we had had all the locks changed in my house because while my parents were visiting my brother in Africa, my sister had broken in and pawned all of our television sets. <laughs> So I hear this noise, and I'm so scared, and my heart is pounding. And I sort of stand up fearfully, and I, I start walking into the hallway, and my heart's pounding like when you like, think you're going to see a ghost or get raped or something. And <laughs> so I get to the hallway, and, and I look, and I can sort of see through the, uh, the, the door to the first floor bathroom. And my sister is breaking in through the window. and. I don't, want, I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm not going to stop her because, like, she could kick my ass. <laughs> so she, she rips out the screen and she gets up the glass and she climbs in and she looks up and she, she looks sort of equally shocked to see me. And it's crazy because she doesn't really look like the badass of my childhood or like the annoying, irritating, yet lovable tramp of my adolescence. <laughs> She looks like a stranger. She's filthy, and her skin is green, and she has all these <laughs> sores all over her body. And, um, you know, she's wearing all of this clothing, even though it's 90 degrees out. And, uh, and I'm terrified. And she sort of looks at me, and she must have known, because she looks hurt. And she just says, are you scared of me? Don't be scared. Just call mom, OK? Just call mom. So I call mom. And we go to the kitchen to wait for her. And my sister, you know, she wants to seem hard. And she's sort of out of it. And she opens the refrigerator. And she's rifling through uh, for a drink. Um, but my mom is a real lightweight. So she can't buy the full bottles of Corona. She can only buy like the tiny, like, Coronitas. <laughs> So my sister grabs a Coronita out of the fridge, pops it open, she's like chugging these tiny bottles like she's some like junky giant. <laughs> and uh, my mom finally comes home and she, she comes to the kitchen and she looks completely haggard and my sister starts to ask her for money. And my mom always gives my sister money, but this time she looks at her and she says, no, just go away, Jillian. I don't have anything for you, just go away. And I feel so bad for my sister because her luck has finally ran out. And I know how that feels because it had happened to me the night before. And I also feel bad because she doesn't really step she doesn't really understand that um, the reason she's being sent away is that I'm so fucked up that my mom just doesn't have any energy for her anymore. But on the other hand, there's some small childish part in, inside of me that's kind of happy and, and says, like, oh, so this is how this feels. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.